Okay, so I got this white privilege that they're talking about. But frankly, I don't think that white privilege is my biggest privilege. It's not. You know, I'm a white guy from New England. I'm a Connecticut white. I'm one of those pedigreed whites. I'm an OG white. Okay, I'm not I'm not the same white as a West Virginia white. And I'd like to start this podcast off with an acknowledgement that I'm on occupied land of the New England Confederation, the English settler state that existed between 1643 and 1686. This is the Illegitimate Scholar Podcast, where you get an understanding of our culture that isn't limited by neoliberal woke universities. I'm Sam, and I'm here to speak to you, the person that wants to be informed and involved with your culture and community, but doesn't trust mainstream academia. I'm doing this because I quit my history teaching program so I could do this podcast and talk about what I really wanted to talk about, not what was selected for me to teach. Today, is race the most important trait for predicting success? How do we define success? What metric? What do we use to decide what success means? How some people are doing better than others? What other traits are important? With this knowledge, you can better understand your place in our culture and be better equipped to understand where people got to where they are so you can advance your own goals, whatever they are. So race is really popular to talk about in America. Uh, there's a lot of stuff written about it, a lot of stuff posted about it. It's in the media a lot. There's other things, but race is probably the most prominent one. I think most people would agree with me on that. And this is an American idea, but it's even ex exported to other countries like in Europe. European soccer players, they have armbands that are against racism and, and stuff like that. But race isn't the only factor, right? And, there, and you know, there's other ones that, that people talk about. There's other ones that people do talk about and that the mainstream does talk about. And when I'm, what I'm thinking about there is I'm thinking about like, you know, sex, uh, religion, you know, national origin. Um, there's only a few that are actually protected in discrimination federally. And there, there's a few other by state, but those are Race, color, sex, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, pregnancy, religion, national origin, age, disability, and genetic information. So those are the ones that are legally protected by the by the state. Like you, you can have a discrimination lawsuit if you are discriminated against on that basis. Oh, and age is only for forty and above. So if you're discriminated because you're too young, doesn't count. By the way. But those aren't the only factors that are like immutable characteristics. And what I mean by that is characteristics that you can't really change. There's other factors besides that uh, that exist. And, and a lot of those have differences that you can find in research with outcomes. So a lot of the times people concentrate on these ones that are more popular to discuss. And they, they overlook the other differences in innate characteristics that people have. So some of these traits are discussed more than others, but that doesn't mean that other traits that aren't discussed as much don't also have a big impact. And there's different reasons why uh, certain traits are discussed over others. And some of those are good reasons. Some of those are bad reasons. But at the very least, there are reasons that are worth discussing. So while race is very important and can be a large decider in what a person's life is like, there are other traits that will also make a difference in someone in someone's life. And some of those don't get talked about as much. So I want to talk about some of those today. Um, and I, I'm going to pop this off with with just one example, just just one first example. And that is that. Uh, and I'm going to start this off with one example, and then we're going to go into a few other differences. In the Black Lives Matter protest, there was a big concentration on being on black people being killed by police, which uh, is a thing that happens. Unfortunately, unfortunately, people are killed by police, and, and that's not that's not good. We don't want that happening. And in a lot of cases, sometimes you know, sometimes it's deserved, but it happens more to black people than it does to other people, um, and people don't like that, and that's fair. But at the same time, when I, I looked at these statistics, because I was thinking like, huh, I wonder what the difference is based on other factors. And what I found is that, yeah, black people are more likely to be killed by police, but it's really black men that are most likely to be killed by police. So you add that second quantifier in there. You you go from just race to, to race and sex together. What you find is that a black man is the most likely to be killed by the police. And what you don't find is that a black woman is very likely to be killed by the, by the police. 
This is important because the logic goes that black people are being killed by police because they're racist, or at least this is the narrative that some people put out. And I think it's more complicated than that. I, I think that discrimination does play uh, it does play a role in this, but I don't think it's the sole decider. And I, I think when you look at black women and black men and the differences in how they're killed by police, uh, you can see this illustrated because if it were just black people in general, you would expect to see those numbers between the sexes being a lot closer together. But what you actually see is that race isn't the greatest indicator of whether someone is killed by the police or not. It's actually your sex because men are way more likely to be killed by the police than women. Um, and while a black man is, I think, three or four times likely on average to be killed by police than a white man, but white men between the ages of 25 and 29 are killed at a rate between seven and a half and 12 times as high as black women. So if you're a black woman, you're much less likely to be killed by the police than a white man. If you're a white dude and you're walking around thinking the cops aren't going to kill you, I got some bad news for you, man, because you're not as safe as you think you are. And, I'm, you know, I'm not saying the cops are going around trying to kill everybody, but I am saying that, you know, you should be careful and you should know how to talk to police. I see videos online where somebody is talking about how black parents have to tell their tell their kids how to deal with police and white parents don't. And when I see those videos, I'm like, dude, do not tell white parents that they don't have to tell their kids how to deal with cops because number one, my parents, my dad taught me how to deal with cops. He did. I mean, it, it's it, it. That's the truth. I mean, that happened. And I'm glad he did. And everybody should because you should know how to deal with cops because they kill plenty of white guys. I mean, they, they kill. There's a, there's not a non zero chance that you're going to get shot by a police by, by a cop, no matter who you are. I mean, you're more likely to get killed by someone else. But, you know, it's not like you're immune to being killed by a cop if you're white. OK. So there's some other I mean, there's a bunch of differences. We're going to go over a few of them. Um, height, height is a huge difference that people don't talk about. I, and I think everyone can be very honest. If, if you're a human and you pay attention to anyone around you, you can see that in general, people that are taller are treated a little bit better than people who aren't as tall. You know, I I'm six foot one and I've noticed that people treat me differently than they do other people because I'm taller. Um, and I'm very attractive. And attractiveness makes uh, people be nicer to you as well. Um, so uh, especially for men, especially for men, short men get shit on all the time and people think it's totally OK. And I don't fucking think it's OK. Um, and everybody, everybody knows this. If you're in a social circle where you don't hear a negative thing about short men sometimes, please let me know because I'd like to hang out with your friends because they seem very nice and I don't believe you. I don't need to really cite a study for this one. Like, it's obvious that shorter people are treated worse by society than taller people, I think. But I do have a study. Anyway, so there is a number of studies. I found studies in China, the US, and the UK. And they found that every inch increase in height gives between 1% and 2% uh, income per year per inch, which is just crazy. I mean, it's it's that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. So if you're 6 inches taller you could have like a higher than 10% earnings improvement um, over somebody who's six inches shorter than you. In this study that says one or 2%, it controls for your gender and how fat you are and these other factors that they think are important. Um, and apparently this isn't just social. So th there was also, gen and th this is a quote, genetic markers associated with increased height were also associated with other advantages, including higher cognitive ability and a lower risk of depression. And I don't know if I believe that, I mean, I read that in this study, but I don't know if I believe it because Asians are pretty short and they all seem pretty smart to me. But I think the suicide thing does make sense because that's like a that's unfortunately something that we see in South Korea and Taiwan and, and Japan quite a bit. I want to talk about the difference between ethnicity and race. So race would be those larger categories, black, white, Asian slash Pacific Islander those ones. And then ethnicity is a little bit more broken down. So, you know, Peruvian, Irish, um, Rhodesian, stuff like that. So in America, an Indian American, somebody who is from India, Indian, um, yeah, dots, not feathers, $126,000 a year. They make on average $126 a year, which is more than double the median American income of all Americans. And then going a little bit lower, the Irish, the Irish Americans, at a respectable 76,000. 
And then uh, another example I picked out, Appalachian, which is people that identify as Appalachian religion, and these are religion, Appalachian ethnicity, and these are people who have been living in Appalachia for likely hundreds of years, and uh, they it's it's a lot of Scots Irish, lots of Scots, um, heavy Protestant area, and these are people who consider themselves Appalachian, and they make forty nine thousand dollars a year, which is which is pretty low compared to it, it's one of the lowest lowest groups and then jamaican at sixty two thousand dollars a year and this might surprise you because jamaicans are black and sixty two thousand dollars a year that's that's pretty close to the irish and and a lot of them are recent immigrants and this is going to be important later and it's going to lead me into talking about um, a black person versus an african-american and the difference is very important when i'm saying african-american it you know it's a little misleading not an african-american like Elon Musk is an African American. I'm talking about African American as an ethnic group. And that means in an anthropological sense, like in anthropology, how that is used is that African Americans are Americans, uh, black Americans who are descended from freed slaves in the United States. So it doesn't include freed slaves from Jamaica that then came to the United States. It just includes the ones that were enslaved in the United States. Um, and there's a big there's a big disparity in this, and I'm going to come back to this. Uh, and the state. State is very important. Um, the state you're born in. I know you can move, but most people don't. So it, it's kind of an indicator. And the state that you grow up in sort of decides a lot of things. You know, you might go to a worse school if you live in a certain place than another place. Not as connected to the mainstream rich culture. Uh, when I say rich culture, I mean the money, not like rich as in like lots of culture. So, for example, Massachusetts, you're making 90000 median. That's a ton of money. $90,000 median. Mississippi, $49,000. It's almost half as much. Same country. Different opportunities. But this one is a little bit unorthodox. But it's something that you don't necessarily have control over. And like other things, is associated with some other factors. And this is uh, your family structure. And the reason this is important is because it is a really, really good indicator of your success in life in a number of ways. So if you look at a single parent versus a dual parent family, what you find is that uh, pretty much by any metric, the dual parent, the child from the dual parent household is going to be more successful in, in any met metric. College attainment, um, income, uh, incarceration are the three that I'm going to touch on. But pretty much anything, you're, you're better off on average. And this goes in when, when you look at the, at the combination of of your family structure and your race, you find something interesting. And a couple of these are that like white kids with single parents. So white households, single parents, they are three times more likely, almost three times to be in poverty than black kids with two parents in their first marriage. In addition to making more money, young white men who grow up with single parents are 18% likely to go to prison Whereas young black men with two bio parents are 14%. So uh, while there, there is the narrative that um, black people go to prison more than white people, and, and this is actually true, that is true if you break it up by race, black people are more likely to go to prison. You can also break it up by this family structure. And I did. And what you find is that, yes, young white men, if they have a single, if they grow up in a single parent household, they are more likely to go to prison than black men who grow up in a dual parent household. So certain of these traits are prioritized more than other traits in our culture. And I mean, that's just the truth. I mean, if they pay more attention to these traits than other traits, that means they're being prioritized. Um, and, you know, the fact that race is paid attention to a lot, I think it makes sense, but I don't think that it's conclusive. So race, th the way that we think about race is very uniquely American. It's very, it's very new. It's Well, it's very unique to the Western Hemisphere. Um, race is thought of in a lot of ways in the rest of the world as your ethnicity in the same way. Like the Japanese people largely think of themselves as the Japanese race, the same as the Chinese people. Um, whereas in America, we, you know, I'm white. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I sometimes talk about my ethnicity, but really for most important things, I'm, I'm a white guy. Um, I'm a white guy with Irish and Hungarian ancestry, but I'm a white guy. So family structure is a very good indicator of your success. 
and yet it's not talked about as much. I, I, I think one of these reasons is that it is less visible. You can't look at somebody and know that they are, uh, that they come from a single family household, but you can look at somebody and know that they're black, um, or they're white and people notice those differences in society. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's right. And that doesn't mean that that's the best way to solve the problems we have in our society because to fix a problem, you accurately have to identify what the problem is. And if you don't know what the problem is, then you're attacking the wrong thing. And if you're trying to fix things based on r racism, like you think that racism, uh, which of course is a factor, but I don't think it's that big of a factor when it can be shown that just having a two-parent household um, er erases a lot of the disadvantages that black people in America face. And, you know, I, and I know that some people will likely get angry with me for saying that, but at the same time, I, I hope that you understand that I'm looking at this, trying to understand the problem better so that it can be solved because, you know, I have love and I care for black Americans, white Americans, Asian Americans, all Americans, Canadians too, a little bit less, but, but a lot. And, you know, I, I, I see these problems and a lot of people see these problems and I would love to have a way to fix a lot of the issues that we have in uh, in our country. And I can, you know, I can just do a little bit, but that's what I consider this. I don't consider this me going out and attacking uh, the people that are claiming everything's racism. I, I feel like it's me going out and being like, okay, like, yeah, racism is a thing, but let's see what else. What, what else is a thing? What else is a problem? What else can we solve? What can we look at? What, what can we do that actually addresses this issue, even if it doesn't directly address the racism? Um, and you can address the racism at the same time, but I think you have to address family structure if it's this large of an indicator. Um, and you have to have a conversation about racism when there's differences within the race as well. And if there's differences within the race, why is that? And how can we fix that? How can we make it, how can we help the people that are the most marginalized? Um, so that brings me to kind of the point, which is like, how does this hurt the worst off people in our society? How does the fact that we concentrate on certain traits and ignore others, how does that hurt the most uh, disadvantaged people in our society? And I'm going to start that off by saying that I'm a white guy. Okay, so I got this white privilege that they're talking about. But frankly, I don't think that white privilege is my biggest privilege. It's not. You know, I'm a white guy from New England. I'm a Connecticut white. I'm one of those pedigreed whites. I'm an OG white. Okay. I'm not, I'm not the same white as a West Virginia white. And I'm not saying that I'm better than them. What I am saying is that I had a bunch of opportunities living in suburban New England for success. I, I had every opportunity for success. Yeah. There's a little bit of heroin here. Okay. But you stay off the heroin, you're probably going to be fine. And I, I'm fine, you know? So it's, but somebody from West Virginia, you put me next to them. Somebody says, that's a white man. That's a white man. They both have the same privilege. That's bullshit. I'm way more privileged than that, dude. Way more privileged. And why that's important is because when you, when you choose these characteristics that you think are important, you're then prioritizing those characteristics over other characteristics. And there's a spectrum within each of these characteristics. So there's a spectrum within race. And, you know, the difference between an African American who's descended from free slaves and a uh, a black immigrant or the child or grandchild of a black immigrant who is not descended from American slaves, there is a lot of differences between those two groups. Like I talked about earlier, a Jamaican uh, a Jamaican American makes an average of $62,000, much more than an African American descended from American slaves. When I think about it, a really prominent illustration of this, what I think about is Barack Obama and Kamala Harris. Barack Obama, the first black president, is what people call him. But he was only half black, number one, which uh, gives him an advantage, to be honest. Mixed children, black and white, have a lot more prospects than, than just black kids. Um, and he was the president, but he also wasn't an African-American. He was the son of an uh, uh, Ethiopian immigrant. Oh, shit. Kenyan? Fuck. I should know that. Doesn't matter. I'm going to leave it in. Doesn't matter. Uh, somewhere in Africa, right? Immigrant. Uh, son of an immigrant. 
so he didn't have the the issues associated with you know being brought into America as a slave and being an underclass and being treated horribly for hundreds of years. He didn't have that. And he becomes a president. So it's not really a, yeah, it's a black guy, but it's, it's a, it's a half black guy whose, whose black parent is not from the United States. Uh, and yeah, I, I get it. It looks, he looks like other black Americans, but at the same time, He's from this class that is very much more privileged and overrepresented in elite universities like the one he went to. Um, and Kamala Harris is the same thing. She is not an African-American. She is uh, born to immigrant parents from Jamaica or one of them from Jamaica. And al allegedly her father was descended from a slaveholder. So Barack Obama and Kamala Harris, they are the children of immigrants Whereas like 85% of black Americans are African Americans. They are descended from American slaves. But the president and vice president is a mixed guy whose dad is from Africa and a mixed woman whose dad is from Jamaica, not African American, even though they're only 15% of the blacks. And, and there's something in there that says something. Um, you know, these people, um, Kamala Harris and Barack Obama, they didn't really pull themselves up by their bootstraps. They didn't, they didn't, they were part of the ruling class already, even though they were black. And these people claim to strive for diversity, but they just want the appearance of diversity. They, they want the optics of it. Colleges and corporations, they post their diversity numbers for, for this reason. If you go to your college, uh, if, if you go to any college, at the beginning of the year, they're likely, or the end of the year, they're going to put out a diversity report that says, oh, we have 14% black students. We have 42% students of color. We have 55% women, like all these things. But that doesn't like, that doesn't tell the whole story because they're not breaking it down in ways where they're actually showing that they're helping the most disadvantaged people. They're grabbing a almost a much less important trait like race without any other qualifiers on it. And they're saying, well, we have this many students that are black and that we're checking off that box. It doesn't matter about diversity of thought or diversity of where they're from. It doesn't matter to actually reach the most disadvantaged people. What matters is that they can show on a piece of paper that they had enough students that were the right skin color. And hidden in that is that they are getting the people that are most advantaged, most equipped to do okay, most equipped to already be um, in a position of authority, but they are able to put those numbers out and they're able to say, we have this percentage of black people. And that's really what they care about because that that's, what's popular. That's what's, uh, that's what gives them prestige that they can say something like that. Because those are things that the elite find very important. They don't think it's important to have people from single family households because they don't, they don't check for that type of thing. So is race the most important metric? What else matters? How do you fit into these metrics and what do they say about you? More importantly, who are you as an individual? What can you do despite what statistics might say about you and your goals? These types of stats can be really demoralizing, make you feel like you're incapable of reaching a higher level than what your upbringing might decide. But this isn't true. These are all average. It might be harder for some, but with the right mindset and understanding, you can work your way up. If you want to discuss any of these ideas, um, you want to get a better understanding of all of this by talking with like-minded people who uh, can share their perspectives, share their ideas with you, um, then please join all of us on the Discord, which is linked in the podcast description below. Thanks a lot.